All right, three of you are here. Um, yeah, apologies. The I'm running off of a mobile hotspot now, so there might be a bit of a delay. Uh, but please still put stuff in the chat. For me, it's still loading. Um, but I'm just going to carry on shortly. And uh, I'll make sure to, to splice these videos correctly for uh, the recorded class so you don't have to deal with that. Um, Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, back to the agar stuff. Again, this is what it looks like if, if you left it out and didn't refrigerate it or anything. Um, these are the plates that I put parafilm around and did refrigerate. None of them have contamination or at least are showing signs of that. So that's just, you know, to show you that it does matter how you store this stuff. Ideally, if you poured plates, you would use them within 24 hours of pouring them. Um, if I autoclave, which I often do for agar, I'll keep them in the fridge for many weeks just because I prefer to make a ton at a time because um, they go through a lot. But for this kit and for really basic stuff, if you're just getting to know mushrooms, fresh agar is definitely best. Uh, if anyone tried cloning, let me know how it went, what it looks like. Uh, if it's you're getting like nice fluffy white colonies like this, or if you're getting that, maybe you have some mold as well. Um, it's not the end of the world, but that's also why we suggest making multiple plates of clones, assuming that something will go wrong with one of them. Your chances of having a clean culture go up uh, drastically. So this chat is still not loading for me. Um, I'm gonna log in as if I am a student, see if I can just do it that way. Sorry about this, guys. Sorry about this. Okay, so I can see chat on YouTube now. All right, can you autoclave those plastic dishes? No, I mean, you can, and I've seen people do it, but they will melt for sure. You can get glass ones. Um, if you really wanna use something reusable, something that a lot of people in the micro world use are these little jelly jars. So uh, you can autoclave these, and obviously you can pour like a very shallow bit of agar and culture like that, but plates are inexpensive. They are wasteful for sure, but, um, you know. Until we get truly biodegradable plastic sterile Petri plates, um, I think plastic and like the jelly jars are your best bet. Um, all right, and then let's see. You tried cloning Wednesday, Lion's Mane, my talking, the glow in the dark one, nothing visible yet. Um, that's probably normal. It's for only two days. It might take a while to kick off. Um, you know, this, this is a week. So it took seven days for it to show these little bitty colonies. And it probably wasn't until day four uh, until there was something like truly growing and, and satisfactory, at least to the, on the macro scale. Do they have PPE petri dish plates? Possibly. Yeah, look into it. Um, all right. Does anyone else have questions from last time's demo? How is your agar doing? Everything look good? So I'm going to move on to the lecture portion. Okay. So. So like I said in the beginning, we are going to discuss cultivation. And 
Since I can't see the chat on Restream, I'm just going to go through a few slides and then check back in on YouTube every few. Um, and feel free to ask questions, but we will save time in the end as well. Uh, when do you do brain spawn? Well, we'll get there. Uh, that's today's demo. And then we're also going to go over that uh, in this lecture. So. All right. So the first thing I wanted to discuss is cultures. So there are so many ways you can get a hold of a fungal culture. You can purchase them. You can clone them. Um, you can take dry specimens, all this stuff. But not every culture is going to be the same, even if it's, even if it's the same species. So let's say you want to grow Heresia marinaceus. That's lion's mane. Even though it would be genetically uh, eligible to be that species, strain to strain, they vary so much. Um, and this is like probably the number one thing you want to do for successful mushroom growing is making sure that you're getting a good culture. Um, a strain is just an isolate of a single fungus. You know, I mean, think of Homo sapien. We're all the same species, but person to person variety is uh, drastic. Typically, you can get cultures, like mycelial cultures, which is what I prefer to work with and what I would recommend most people to work with unless you want to get into breeding. But mycelium is already an isolate. It's a dicaryotic network of fungal cells, typically one species. And you can get them in liquid culture syringes like you got in your kit, agar slants, which is what you see in the picture, and then petri plates. Um, freeze-dried mycelium is also available. This is mostly something you see in like the tech world, um, you know, more like B to B, lab to lab providing. But the Odin's actually working on a method to freeze-dry mycelium because it lasts a lot longer. Um, petri plates are probably the least have the least shelf life of all of these. Liquid culture would be next. Um, agar slants. The, the third or the second best, and then freeze-dried mycelium, if done correctly, um, the absolute best. And then, of course, there's things like liquid nitrogen, but who has a liquid nitrogen tank hanging around? Not you, not us, not me. The Odin, but not me. Okay. Um, and you can also culture fungi from solid media. So that strain of Pinellas stipticus that you have, I got that from a plug spawn. And plug spawn is basically like a dowel rod, a piece of wood that's allowed the mycelium to colonize it enough to where if you drilled a hole in a log and you put this little dowel in it, in a year or two, that mycelium would have made its way through the medullary rays of the log and fruit. Um, that's a, that method of cultivation is attractive for a lot of reasons, but it does take a very long time. Typically, it's done outside, so you are way you're really hands off with with log culture. But that this strain of Pinellas stipticus that I gave you guys, that one just happened to be the fastest growing and brightest ones of all the ones I sourced. So I had friends send me some. I purchased uh, like agar slants from random stores on the internet, and then the plug spawn from this company. Is by far the best. So that's the one that we went with. And that was as simple as plating it on agar. Usually with plug spawn, you're not expecting to get something clean because you're putting it in a log. There's no really like lab or culturing step required. So generally, if people are making plug spawn, they're not going to be attempting to give you something super clean. So what I had to do with a lot of these is grow them out on agar. This one was really clean. But a few days later, I started to see a bit of green mold. And um, what you do in this situation is just keep culturing before the mold has a chance to sporulate and you can clean it or, you know, isolate it from the contaminants. So, um, no questions. Okay. Another form of um, fungal material that you can get to propagate is in the form of spores. Uh, spore prints are common 
Often they'll come like on a piece of foil, a spore syringe, which looks exactly like the liquid culture syringe, except you won't see little filaments of mycelium growing. You'll just see these, maybe not even see, but microscopic like dust particles in there. And spores, so if you were to take this spore print in this picture and swap it out on an agar plate, each colony that germinated would be its own set of genetics. And many times they're not gonna be um, compatible with its surrounding colonies. So if you took a spore syringe and squirted it into a liquid culture and kept growing it, you would have all sorts of colonies of different strains of that species growing in one vessel. And if you imagine propagating that to grain and other substrate, you know, there's going to be one or a few that outcompete the rest. And that can be a decent way to isolate like the most um, virulent species or the most virulent, sorry, strain within all of those possible combinations. Um, but that's not something like you would typically do unless you are trying to provide good cultures to people, then multi-spore syringes and things like that, it can actually be great because you let the biology decide which pairing, which mating types are best for those conditions. Also, spore prints don't usually come clean. Um, like this picture looks like it was just done on a piece of copy paper and cardboard which usually having doing a spore print on light and dark paper like that is good because you can have really dark spores and really light spores and having the contrast gives you a better idea of the color if you're doing this for something like identification. Because there's some mushrooms out there that look identical except for the color of their spores. If it's purple, it's this thing. If it's white, it's this other thing. Um, this is also something that's really easy to do. So if you find a mushroom out in the woods and it hasn't sporulated yet, you can even find some at the store and be able to do this. You just remove the stem, put the cap down on a piece of paper, and then oftentimes you could put like a bowl or a glass over it um, to prevent any like wind from coming through. And you'll get a really nice spore print from that. Um, checking questions. Okay. So when you're culturing, you are going to run into contamination. Or you, you very well could. It's something every fungus farmer has to deal with. And the one on the right, that is mold. This is typically going to be from a genus called Trichoderma. It's not toxic. It's not bad. There's actually Trichoderma farms who provide this fungus to other agricultural people who are growing uh, some kind of plant because this is a great soil fungus. Um, it's not toxic, but it is a bummer because usually this fungus will outcompete the fungus you're trying to grow. And that's just not great. But it looks like that. Um, once you get really familiar with, with this, you'll start to notice it in the mycelial stage and that's good because it has yet to sporulate. That little colony of just mycelium could have come from a couple spores, whereas now, if you're seeing this dusty green stuff, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of spores now. And, and combating that is going to be a lot more difficult than just dealing with a few colonies of a couple dozen germinated mold spores. Again, it's not toxic, but just if you see it, don't get too upset. Um, don't open it too. If you if you have petri plates like this that have mold colonies on it, don't open it. Just toss it um, because you're gonna let the spores out, and then they'll be in the ambient space, and you know that's just less clean air. And then the petri plate on the right is more what bacterial contamination looks like, and often yeast too. So yeast creates almost like this fractal type pattern. Um, it's very rare for me to see yeast contamination. If I ever see it, it's usually green mold. And um, bacterial contamination, you can mitigate that really easily with antibiotics, um, but that's the difference. And yeah, it's, it's definitely good to monitor your stuff every day because mold 
will show up within 12 hours. Like there was, there's been times where I've gotten to work at the Odin. I've seen a little mold growing somewhere. And then by the end of the day, before I leave, that little white colony has turned green. So it's good to check on your fungus and um, take action as soon as possible. Uh, Trichoderm is the main fungus used in biotech. Yeah, if not Saccharomyces cerevisiae, yeast. Yeast is also a big one. Um, yeah, man, if, I, if we were a trike farm, I'd be a pro, let me tell you. Okay, so testing your cultures. It's good to point out that with liquid culture, like what I gave you, if there was mold in there, there's no way to tell because it's not going to sporulate until it has access to air. Sure, it could make a colony on top of a liquid culture, kind of like a, like a SCOBY situation, and then it would turn green. But in the syringe like that, you just have to trust that the, the mycelium in there is what I told you it was. But if you want to test this, you can squirt a little bit, like one mil, not even, onto agar, and you basically get a panel of all the things that are growing in there. Hopefully what you see is homogenous mycelium, you know, one type. Panellus stipticus is especially lovely to work with because it glows. So, you know, I, I can see white fluffy stuff on my plates, but ultimately like there are many fungi that look like that. Um, so it's, it's great to have like a visual characteristic in a mycelium to be able to diagnose whether or not that is what it is. But liquid culture, you do have to be a little careful with. I've bought so many liquid cultures in my life and yeah, I would say maybe 10% of them have been contaminated. Um, also just be mindful of where you're purchasing them. You know, look at the websites, discern for yourself if they seem like they're being thoughtful and careful with uh, what they do. But yeah, there's, it's really easy to um, get contaminated cultures in this form. Agar plates less so because generally people aren't gonna send you an agar plate with mold on it. Um, so if you get it and it doesn't have mold on it, you can be confident that it's not contaminated. Um, but it could be old. And if that's the case, it's not gonna grow very fast for you. So to test an agar sa sample, just make a transfer and hopefully you'll see something take off, you know, relatively quickly. And it would, it should look like super fluffy and happy and, and good mycelium. Um, yep, so it's also worth saying that, and you've probably noticed this, if you guys inoculated the grain, that each species has different growth rates. So the oyster is probably gonna be the fastest one. The Ganoderma, the second, and Pinellus stipticus is by far the slowest. So I even have some grain spawn examples here for you. Um, these were inoculated on the same day, and you can see that the reishis completely taken off. It's, it's ready to be expanded. Whereas Pinellus stipticus, I'm going to give it another couple weeks. So, you know, you got to get to know your fungus a little bit, take notes, um, be patient, and spend some time with them, you know, look at them. So that's a good transition to this one. Agar is great because unlike liquid culture, you can really start to notice the mycelial characteristics show themselves. So in this picture, there's different mediums, of course, but there's also every agar plate is a different fungal species. And some of them are going to be super rhizomorphic, which means that their filaments make these rope colonies. Um, Psilocybe is like that. There's a, quite a few like dung loving mushrooms that have that characteristic. The Ganoderma is like very hydrophobic. So I have a video that maybe I'll upload for you later of dropping like water droplets on a Ganoderma plate, which this is one here, this is one here, and this is one here. And it's so hydrophobic. It looks like those old school toys with a bead of mercury that you just try to get through the maze. Um, and I've, I haven't seen that much hydrophobic activity in a fungus before. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the wispiness, the color even, Ganoderma has some melanin expression. That's what this like darker brown area looks like. Um, 
Probably my favorite one on agar is going to be armillaria. It creates these big, ropey, melanized <clears throat> rhizomorphs that almost look alien. And I have a cool culture. This one's really, really old, like almost two years old now, but um, you can kind of see what they do. And they'll even like pop out of the agar like this. This is um, a sample from the so-called biggest organism on earth. And yeah, you know, it's fun. If you wanna get to know your fungus, put it on some, some agar and it'll be expressive. Um, how long can you keep healthy plates going? That's a good question, Lon. So it, it does depend on the species, but generally you wanna keep that within two to three months. If you put it in the fridge, you can keep it for a lot longer. I have some plates in the fridge that I've been culturing from for almost nine months, but it's getting to the point where I'm going back to the mother culture, which is just an agar slant. Um, and slants are good because there's all of this agar, all of this food in the tube, but it can't get to it, right? Because the surface area of the, the the accessible agar to the fungus on top is so minimal, but there's still enough food that it, that this is just how I've been explained to it and what I've read about. It's like, it, it knows that there's enough sustenance within the slant and the chances of it drying out are a lot less as well. Um, what did I call that? Can you be more specific, Hooligan Laboratory? Okay, so I'll wait to hear from you, but move on. Okay, uh, senescence is other, another thing. So this is just biology for you. Things age and deteriorate. Um, it happens in fungal cultures a lot, but it's hard to identify. So the ways to mitigate it is obviously proper storage, like we talked about, um, refrigerated stuff, the agar or whatever media is gonna last longer. It's not gonna dry out as quickly. Um, putting parafilm around your plates helps, keeps the moisture in. Dark spaces as well, so you're not giving the signal to the mycelium to try and propagate. Um, it'll almost kind of go dormant. And the culture media itself, uh, like we talked about. Another thing to be mindful of, if you get one culture and you don't think you'll ever get that culture again and you wanna make it last as long as possible, I recommend taking that one culture and making quite a few transfers. Do it in agar slants, do it in agar, um, and make more transfers less often. So the way I was told to think about it when I was getting into this was, imagine each time you take a piece of mycelium from its source and put somewhere else it's like moving to a new house and it just requires a lot of energy so um instead of taking a tissue sample from one plate and moving it to another and then another and then another and making 10 that way just take 10 different tissue samples from one plate that's just less stress on um, the fungus another thing is to culture from hyphal tips so if i were to culture this I would take from the very edges of the colony. Why? Because that's where all the biological activity is. Um, here's a video that shows you like a, a hyphal tip and a fungus is like, imagine dumping all of your organs and all of the contents into your head. And like, that's where so much of the nuclei and activity is. So if you're gonna take a sample, you wanna get as much information and, and material as you can. Um, and this is a video of a hyphal growth. And you can really see all of that, all of those contents um, in the tips. So let's see, I'm gonna check on questions. Can I show a slant? Yeah. So here is a slant. It's in a 15 ml tube. Uh, these come sterile. I just autoclave the agar, poured it in there, leaned it like this. So I let it solidify like this. And then um, took a bit of 
tissue or um, another piece of agar and laid it in like that. So these are great. This is probably, you know, the most faithful long-term culture that I've worked with. We are also working on freeze drying, which I'm excited for. And of course, when we have a protocol, um, we'll upload it, but I don't expect anyone to be able to freeze dry their fungus. It's mostly to provide the cultures for you so that if you get a freeze dried uh, culture, you can keep it indefinitely. That, that would be the idea. The fungus on the plate you showed us has wild mycelium. Yeah, this, this strain also glows, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm hoping to add that to our culture library and sell it on the website eventually. Do you lean the slant to give it more surface area of the agar? Yeah, a little bit. Instead of like drying it like this, you know, add a, um, just a little bit of a lean. Yes, very similar to plates. Okay, and we're a little behind because of the technical issues in the beginning, so I'll kind of just blow through this, but a culmination. So um, usually after you're done with all this culturing stuff, you're gonna move from defined media to like organic food, solid materials. And this is what we're gonna do today. This is what you started last week. Generally, you're gonna go from liquid culture or agar to a grain spawn. And that's gonna be um, some type of grain. This can be a wide variety of things. It can be like popcorn, millet, rye berries, any grain really um, will qualify. And then you move that on to um, a more bulk substrate. However, I've seen many people fruit off of the grain. Um, you could get way more out of your culture if you don't do that because grain spawn is wonderful. It's just so mycelially dense, like you can tell from this, there's a lot going on here. And I could expand this into probably three bags, five times its size. Um, so it's worth it. Uh, liquid cultures are usually autoclaved water with a sugar source. So I tend to just use malt. Um, we sell some at the Odin now too, that's a little bit more, there's, uh, let's see, like malt, peptone, and yeast extract, and some antibiotics if you wish. And it's great. You grow a lot of fungus really quick with uh, water or liquid culture. It also allows you to get quality and quantity of distribution from your culture. So imagine if you had like a tw 20 grain bags or 20 jars of grain spawn and you wanted to inoculate all of that. Not only would it be laborious to use a plate or something from agar, but the, there's more risk for contamination and there's just like less biomass to work with. But with liquid culture, you can grow it up in even a quart sized jar, that goes a long way. So for every person who ordered this class, I was able to get a 10 milliliter syringe from like one quart sized mason jar. And that's pretty awesome. Like liquid culture is a great way to scale your fungal stuff. Uh, talked about spawn, you know, it can be anything. This is what, new spawn fresh out of the autoclave looks like um, with no fungus and then that's about what you want to go for before you propagate it if you do make spawn in a jar which there'll be a video uploaded in the google drive if you want to make your own it does require a pressure cooker but uh you always want to leave some space you can also just buy these online if you want to uh, because you want to shake that up especially with the ganoderma if you allow that fungus to fully colonize the grain and you shake that jar like really violently sometimes you won't get it to budge and it'll just become like this brick which is great that's one of the best things about Ganoderma that's why it's the genus that's most commonly used in mycomaterials but you need to be mindful of the timing when working with it so like you can tell that this one's all jumbled up because every day I was shaking it to make sure that it didn't harden into one big block so that I could like you know, distribute this into more than one thing. If I was just dumping this whole thing into one bag, it wouldn't be as much of a problem. But if you do want to distribute it, you know, shake it up. And the bags are easier because you can massage it. 
right? It doesn't matter if you let it go too far. Um, you kind of just have to wrestle with it, and it is annoying, but jars have that extra hurdle. But they're reusable, and um, I really pref prefer them to bags. So let me check on questions. Um, have I tried spend grain that you get at the end of brewing? I haven't, but there are many people who have, and I don't think it works nearly as well as fresh stuff because in the brewing process, a lot of that food gets consumed by yeast and other things. Um, but I think that would be better to be used as a bulk substrate. So there's, in the rye berries and stuff, there's lots of like good, nu nutritious, sugary things. And then the bulk substrate tends to be something like hardwood, which at this point you're just eating like cellulose and lignin. Um, and those two polymers would definitely be um, in a spent grain. How many days old is the grain bag? I did mine Wednesday and I can't see anything happening. Mark, that's normal. I would give it another week. So I'll show you in the demo what the ones that I did last week look like. They're not going to look like that. Um, it'll take a while. But this is about two weeks. I did this on April 1st. Should we be shaking or massaging our inoculated grain bags? Yeah, I would once it turns fully white. But when it's just kicking off, you want to let the fungus establish itself. Um, but yeah, once it turns fully white and like this, then it, you would be, this is a good opportunity to mix it. And you could have done it even before it got to this phase. Yeah, Cindy, that's probably normal. Just give it a while. And the, the temperature of where you're storing this stuff can influence the growth, but most likely, most of you won't be able to expand on your grain for two weeks after you inoculate them. So don't, don't be too concerned. And if you are, you can send me pictures. Um, I'll show you in the demo what my week old one looks like and it also doesn't look that grown yet okay what's an example of grain spawn being too different from a destination so that's a good question i mean i don't think there is such thing if you're using like organic materials because the grain is going to have some of that cellulose and lignin in it so trying to find a grain that's radically different from its destination substrate is just, I don't think you, don't worry about it. Um, if your destination substrate was like plastic, or if you're trying to prime a fungus to eat something it's not usually supposed to eat for remediation or something, then that's when I would not go from like grain spawn to, you know, petroleum soaked wood chips or something. You, you would definitely want to prime it a bit um, but for just growing mushrooms you know we don't we don't need to worry about that uh, okay there's other types of spawn as well so the plug spawn we talked about a bit rope spawn uh, this is something that mycologists do so rope it's just a bunch of cellulose fibers it's just as delicious as some wood chips and yeah depending on your applications like rope might be really helpful for you um, but I just wanted to show you that you can be creative with how you expand your fungus because the saprophytes that we're working with, they're used to eating dead plant material and that there's a lot of things in that category. Uh, general rule of thumb for fruiting mushrooms is to emulate the substrate that they're naturally found growing in. Now, you can totally vary that. Like I said last week, some mushrooms will even fruit on agar. They don't need the same exact food. But just imagine that you have a pet. Like you want to give them the food that their systems have evolved to eat to be as healthy as they can be. Uh, so that's, you know, a similar dogma that we have in the mycology world. And I will upload a graph that shows like ideal substrates for the fungus. Uh, this is a, just an overview of the three cultures that we gave you. So honestly, they could all use each other's. 
um, but you can optimize them. So Anellostypticus, I noticed, grew so well on birch, but it's really difficult to get birch here in Texas, uh, especially those birch firewood bricks. Uh, they, they do exist. They're all in Scandinavia, and the shipping is just ridiculous, so it's not even worth it. But, um, you know, these things make a difference. And with the Ganoderma, like, if you add things like beet, it influences the color of the mushroom, and you can really play with these substrates. But if even if you just had straw and, like, random hardwood wood chips, which is basically what those fire bricks are, you're going to get mushrooms. There's just ways to optimize it. Uh, there's also supplementation. So you can add extra stuff. In your media kits, you have bags of starch. There's two bags. One's going to be for Pinellas Tipticus. One is going to be for Ganoderma. Um, the Pinellas Tipticus, the starch does a couple things. Like One, it encourages the mycelial biomass, but it also makes it glow a lot brighter. And um, we won't add that immediately upon inoculating the, the bricks. We'll add that a little bit later after the mycelium's had some, a chance to colonize the substrate a little bit. And you should know notice a spike in both growth and glow. Um, but it's a very sugar-rich food, so you want to be careful because um, it's an opportunity for other microorganisms to consume it. Okay. Um, the particle size of the substrate is also important. So if you were to grind your wood up to be like sawdust thin, it's not going to take off as well. And same if you have big chunks of wood, you know, you just like chopped up with an axe or something. You want, you want an aggregate that will support the scale of the mycelium. The stuff you're going to get from your bricks is a pretty ideal size of particle size. It's part of the reason why I love these things. Um, but you know, be mindful. If you want to grow mushrooms on the wood that you have growing on your property or something, grind it up to be, um, similar to what you're going to see in the, with the fire bricks. And then the packing of the material makes a difference. So this is the fire bricks that I packed into just two glass jars for the reishi. And one of them I just kind of dumped in and like very loosely packed and it took a lot longer to grow. And so far I don't see any mushrooms growing. Um, the other one I packed like pretty hard. Uh, I pushed down with force and shoved more substrate in there and it liked it better. So, you know, there is such thing as packing it too much. You want to have some aeration in there, but yeah, you know, these things matter. Okay, uh, these are the fire bricks that you guys have. They are kiln dried and compacted under high pressure and that treatment kills off so many microorganisms, but not all of them, which is just beautiful because um, I've worked with these enough that they're basically, they basically come pasteurized. So when you dump boiling hot water on them, which is how you reconstitute them and how you make them ready to be substrate, you are sort of pasteurizing things like you pour boiling water on a lot of bacteria it's not going to survive it's going to do a lot but it's not going to kill everything and that's what pasteurizing is i've autoclaved these things too so i've rehydrated it put it in the autoclave tried to inoculate them with grain spawn and i got contamination granted i was doing it without a flow hood but i was trying to make this kit for people not using a flow hood not using an autoclave and I just wanted to get to know this material. Every time I sterilized it, contamination. If I didn't sterilize it, no contamination. So what does that suggest to me? That there's a biological element within these bricks. So there probably is some organisms that survive both the treatment of the brick making and also the boiling water that help in some way the fungus that you inoculate. What that is exactly, no clue, but this is just kind of the beauty of pasteurization. You know, there's going to be other things living in tandem with your fungus, but that don't seem to outcompete it, but maybe prevent or signal mold spores to just remain dormant. Um, so it's good stuff. Uh, these firewood bricks have been pretty revolutionary uh, for 
me at the Odin, and I hope a lot of people out there who want to grow mushrooms in a really low-tech, accessible way. Uh, humidity. So if you fruit your stuff outside of a bag, it matters, and you're going to need to maintain it. You can take a spray bottle full of water and just mist your stuff that way. But what we're going to be doing is basically making a terrarium. So if you have your stuff in jars, the humidity stays consistent. You'll want to mist it like once a week, maybe, but more, probably less than that. Um, and then for the stuff that we're growing, you, I'm going to suggest that you keep it in the bag. Uh, it'll just be safer from contaminants and um, keep the humidity and CO2 in check. Uh, temperature, we discussed a little bit last time, but yeah, there's methods where when you're incubating your fungus, so your grain spawn and stuff, um, if it wasn't kept in a dark room, that's okay. But any time that the fungus is not in a phase of fruiting, the dogma is to keep it in a dark space because we're trying to emulate what it would do in the wild. And mycelium doesn't grow in the day. It grows inside of things, right? It grows underground, in trees, things like that. So we want to maintain those biological signals um, to make it uh, more successful. CO2 affects the morphology and virulence of a fungus, of course. This is especially noticeable with the Ganoderma. So if I were to grow these, this mushroom not in a contained space, but out in the open, I would get like conks. And this is the, the ratio you see on your hikes, you know? They're like these little shelf mushrooms coming out from a tree. And they are completely different morphology if you subject them to high CO2. The beautiful thing here is that a fungi respirate and they make their own CO2. So imagine if you're stuck in a bag breathing, like there's going to be so much CO2 in that space. And that's what's happening here. That's what's encouraging the antler formation. You know, the thought is that they're the fungus is trying to forage for a way out um, to access oxygen. And what's happening in this picture is that a the tip of the mushroom has hit the filter patch. Obviously, it knows where the oxygen is coming from, and it's growing out of that. So I could continue to let this grow, and right where it starts to burst through the filter patch, it's going to create like a little conch, and it's going to look really different from the fungus inside. And you can play with this, you know, like the reason we provided the Ganoderma culture was just because it's an aesthetic mushroom and it's a great materials mushroom. Like open up the bag, let let some oxygen in and then close it and you'll probably see these fluctuations in the mushroom. Okay, no questions? So light, all fungi are photoreceptive. Ganoderma is another example that responds really um, obviously to light, especially blue light. Um, yeah, you if you like turn your bags a lot, um, the antlers tend to grow towards the light. And this is true for a lot of mushrooms, but Ganoderma is just, it, it grows so long. Whereas like the oyster mushroom, you'll notice it'll pin and make oysters and be ready to harvest within two weeks max. Whereas the reishi, you could have that growing for many months. You know, it's kind of this long-term fungus. And even after it's done growing, it's not gonna get moldy and soft and slimy like an oyster mushroom will. It's gonna stay tough and hard and almost be like a living, or not living, but once living sculpture. Uh, they're, they're really sturdy. Other considerations when you're cultivating is nitrogen source and pH. Uh, we're not gonna get into that much in this class because I think the difference with, the, with these strains and this tech is pretty negligible. Uh, but Pinellas stypticus, I was messing with some pH and it seemed to glow a little bit brighter with um, lower pHs. But starch also, starch did just as well as um, citric acid. And then um, if you're ever really serious about farming, this is like the go-to way of knowing if what you're doing is successful or how to track what you're doing in changing the substrate and knowing if it's 
rendering better flushes. Uh, and that's literally just comparing the mushroom weight to the substrate. So you're getting as much mushroom from the food as possible. Uh, so here's some morph morphological examples of Ganoderma. Um, the picture on the left here, that like disc you see, it ran into the filter bag and then I took it off and kind of moved it and like was able to almost like sculpt these, you know, discs in the mushroom. So play with this. Like Ganoderma is really responsive. You can put like a dowel rod in your bag or anything and have it grow up and around it. Um, it's, it's almost moldable in that way that if you grew it up against like something textured too, it would take on that texture. Um, and then this is just interesting. The picture on the right is the Ganoderma sporulating surface. And yeah, it's just the variety is really fun to work with. Um, every single bag I've grown, even if it's the exact same conditions, looks very different. So, you know, embrace it. And you don't have to grow them in filter bags. So this is also something we'll discuss next week, but growing them in bases is great. They're beautiful. They'll last a while. I wouldn't do this for like oyster because it'll get old and rot eventually. Um, but the Ganoderma, this, in this phase will last for months to years, uh, probably years. And yeah, typically, if I'm growing them in a vase, I'll have them in a bag. So like this, um, because I want to keep the humidity and CO2 in check. Okay, another fun thing you can do if you do decide to grow them in the bag, um, you saw how that mushroom went through the filter patch. If you poked a hole in the, the bag too, the mushroom's going to respond and it knows like this is where the air is coming from and it's going to start poking mushrooms out from those holes. So you can design your mushroom sculpture that way. Um, I do also like to eventually put the Pinellas stipticus into a glass jar. It glows for a while, like eight months, up to eight months for sure. So we're going to have it grow out in a bag, but then you can take pieces of that substrate and put them into whatever you want. These are just a bunch of like eight ounce jars. Um, you can share it with friends or whatever. It looks a little nicer than just a bag of dirt. Um, you know, we've experimented with all sorts of stuff and, you know, be creative. <clears throat> this is what Pinellas stipticus mushrooms look like in, uh, in vitro. So if you found these things in the wild, for anyone in upstate New York or um, I think even the Northeast, Northwest, sorry. These things grow in the wild. They look like oyster mushrooms. They have gills. They're pretty big, um, you know, one to two inch and in, across. But for some reason, growing them in the style that we do, we get these more like coral looking primordia. And they, for me, have not fruited technically because they're not creating spores and I've been unable to see that happen. Um, but if you start seeing these little nodules in your Pinellas you stipticus bag or whatever, those are mushrooms. And they glow a lot brighter than the mycelium. And then Pleurotus. Um, I imagine this is the one that most of you are most familiar with. You've probably eaten it a few times. They're probably the easiest ones to work with. They'll eat anything and um, they're fast growing. Yeah, what we usually do with these is have a bag, cut a hole, in one or two sides, and then a whole like bouquet of oysters will fruit out from that. Um, uh, we won't talk about this because we're a little low, or already past time, so I'm gonna just jump into the demo. But again, I would not follow along here unless your grain spawn looks like this, which I'm guessing it doesn't because if you inoculated it one week ago, you're not gonna see this much mycelium yet. But, you know, watch, ask questions, and um, when it, the time is ready, you'll know what to do. So, 
questions? Anyone have questions? I froze again. Okay, I'm sorry. I hope that uh, hope that doesn't happen again. All right. So I've got a kettle here. That's what I'm using to boil water. Um, the bricks that you got, you got four of them in your kit, and they were one cut in half. So if you buy these online and you want to keep growing on your own, they're going to look like this. It creates a ton of substrate. This will almost quadruple in size once you hydrate it, and that is a lot for the, the bags that I provided you. It'll you know, be up to the filter patch. It's just d difficult to work with. This is half a brick um, with water added to it. So this is what yours will look like once you add water to it. Um, while this is boiling, I'm going to be a good farmer and uh, put on my gloves, wipe down the area with isopropyl alcohol, wear a mask, And yeah, so the bag that I did last week, one week and it looks like this. So just to let you guys know if it doesn't look like this in one week, that's totally normal. Yeah, this class is over three weeks, but honestly the entire process of culmination is going to be more like a month and a half. Um, okay. So my water is done boiling and you want to pour it pretty much right away. Be super careful here because it's boiling water and when you pour it in the bag, the bag will almost warp and uh, it, it can be easy to burn yourself. So just, if you have something like a small trash bin or you wanna hold it with a, a tongs or something to protect yourself, you know, just be mindful and you'll see what it looks like, but open up this bag. Remember to have one brick per bag. And then I usually like fold it over so I can grasp it like this, have it open like that. I got my boiling water. Um, I meant to say this earlier, your bricks are gonna range in weight, but for the most part, they're gonna be around 450 grams. So add 700 milliliters of water. Um, it's better to overhydrate than underhydrate these things, but even if it's not a perfect 150, 50% hydration, it's fine. Um, these things are really forgivable. Uh, all right, it's really, really hot, boiling water. Um, and then you guys got zip ties in your dissection kits. You're welcome to use those. You can also use rubber bands, uh, twine. I'm just using a hair tie and I'm gonna tie it off and let this sit for until it cools down. Um, you'll notice that the whole brick isn't completely broken up yet. That's fine. Even if you left this alone, it would eventually fall apart. But I usually like kind of give the bag a shake just to distribute the water and uh, break it up. But remember, it's just hot. So I'm gonna let that bag sit overnight and tomorrow morning inoculate it. But if you wanted to do it same day, you did it in the morning, just feel it. It shouldn't be warm. It should be room temperature. 
Because even warm, nice, warm on your hand can be way too hot for a fungus. You could kill it. But I did one yesterday uh, to have one ready for you today. So once your bag is completely uh, hydrated, it'll look like this. And your grain sponge should look something like this. And this is where you, you want to start thinking about sterility or, you know, a septic technique. So I'm going to spray my hands. I'm going to spray the bag. I'm going to spray this. Spray the surface. And then use some scissors to... What I like to do with these, if I'm going to use it all at once, which I recommend, um, I cut down here. So if there's any part of this bag that has spores in it, I can almost guarantee you it's in the filter because there's like a micro matrix for it to sit. But on this smooth plastic, if I rub some isopropyl on here, I can be really confident that that has nothing on it. So I always just cut below the filter patch if I don't plan on uh, saving some of this and then dump it into the bag. So, hands again. I'll even spray the scissors. Um, and I'll have this ready. So you can take the rubber band off, but it doesn't need to be wide open yet. Um, take the scissors. It's best to get it all in one smooth cut. And um, if, yeah, if you wanted to break it up beforehand, you can too. But since I'm just doing it all in one dump, it doesn't bother. Um, let it fall. And then close it up again. And my rubber band broke, so I'm going to get another one. And then when you inoculate it, it's all on the top. That's fine, but you're gonna have faster colonization if you mix it up a bit. So, you know, just shake it a little bit, make sure the grain's evenly distributed. And uh, with grain spawn that's that well taken off, um, you should start seeing growth in a few days. Um, I'll show you an example of what an oyster looks like after about a week and a half. Oh, this is two weeks. So, it's getting there. Um, eventually, I'll take this out of incubation, which is just a cardboard box under my bench, and um, put it out in the light um, to encourage fruiting. I also wanted to show you this with the reishi. Uh, it's just a big glass vessel. Um, and then I put saran wrap on top and poke holes in it. Because what I'm trying to do is get the mushroom to fruit from those specific spots, um, like they would if I did it in a bag. So, okay, lots of questions. Let's see. Are these special bags that I make them? Do you mean the grain bags, Mon, or the other ones? Because no, I didn't make them. I purchased them from Unicorn Bags. They're a great supplier for bulk filter bags. Um, yeah. Are they porous? Have you tried with micropore bags? I haven't tried micropore bags, but the filter bags are just kind of old faithful. because You can autoclave them a lot and uh, yeah, they tend to just be more standard. I'm not worried about the bags themselves because when you put the grain in there, you, you can buy them pre-sterilized. So everything on the inside of the bag is gonna be sterile. The outside, sure, there could be bacteria all over, but that's why we wipe it with isopropyl alcohol. Um, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. 
Bye, Christopher. Yeah, unicorn bags. Um, but they're more for like bulk suppliers. So unless you're looking to buy like a couple hundred, I would just look on like Shroom Supply or Amazon even. Um, you can get a pack of 50. They can be a little expensive, but you know, they're great. How many bags of wood substrate could you inoculate with that amount of grain spot? So you could probably get away with making three of these with that amount of uh, grain, but it's gonna take longer to grow. And the reason I wanted to have you do the whole grain in this bag is because faster colonization means less likelihood of contamination and just like mushrooms quicker. Um, but yeah, you, you can probably go up to three times. I would say keep the grain spawn to bulk substrate at least 10%. So 10% of this volume wise, um, use at least that much grain spawn and it should be really well colonized grain spawn. So like this stuff is so fluffy. I mean, this, you could totally get away with maybe even something like five because each grain is carrying such a substantial amount of mycelium. Um, I mean, and you could theoretically like use this to inoculate a substrate, but it's just kind of a waste. Like it's not gonna make things faster because you're gonna have to wait for the mycelium to catch up to the substrate anyway. You might as well let it run its course on rye almost finish its food here and then be metabolically prepared to uh, work with a different substrate. So. Does anyone have any more questions? Um, sorry about the technical issues. Next week, um, I'll show you how to put what's in that bag into a secondary vessel. Um, I, again, I don't think once you inoculate your bag, it'll be just one week before your stuff is ready to do that, but I want you to see how to do it. Um, so if you wanna grow like a reishi sculpture in a jar or you know something that's not a plastic bag, uh, I'll show you how to do it. It's pretty easy. Um, I've had the mason jars stall out after half the green being very fluffy and white. Um, what can cause this? Probably lawn, you might have bacterial contamination. Um, it also depends on what species you're working with, but it can, it can also be the grain itself. There's so many things that could have caused that. I've seen it before. Um, but yeah, I would just, you know, use it anyway. Like if, if you have the facilities to like get rid of the part that's not myceliated and go ahead and use it regardless. I've done it before and it's generally okay. Next week's season, next week's season um, we'll be back next Sunday at 10 a.m. CT. Um, how would you make liquid or agricultures from what we grow in the bag? So, it's not the best way to get a culture from a solid substrate, but you could. And like, I've done this before many times, especially with like Ecovative grow kits. They, you get like a colonized hemp substrate. Like you, you can literally to take sweet tweezers, find a good pinch of mycelium and put that on agar and it would work. But you have to consider that at that point in time, the fungus has already done so much that, um, it's best to just reach for cultures that are, so to speak, like younger. Um, but you can do it. And I have done it for like, you know, genetics or cultures of stuff that I couldn't get any other way. What is the purpose of doing this in two stages, rye, grain, then substrate? So Paul, if you were to take liquid or agar and just go straight to the um, sawdust bricks, that's a very different food source and it just will, it, the time it takes for the fungus to adjust is a lot. 
and not only that, not only metabolically is it kind of a shock, but the biomass is such a difference. So like with the grain spawn, you get lots of good fluffy stuff that you can put into a more of a bulk substrate, right? And if you consider like liquid culture, all the media in there is just like insta food. It's sugars that take little to no enzymatic labor for the fungus to absorb. And you want to sort of prime it for that. If you, you know, when I give it grain, like rye, it has that sugary goodness, but it also has some cellulose. It's got lignin, it, got, it has more complicated organic fibers 